You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. This week, I was meeting with somebody, and he was feeling down about an interaction he had with someone else, and he was kind of beating himself up for not saying the right thing, for not being able to give what he thought was the right answer. In other words, he thought when he came out of that interaction with someone, he should have been able to battle plan a road towards healing, a road towards right living. He should have been able to convince someone of what it means to walk with Jesus. And perhaps like me, you too have had these kind of moments in life where you feel like you have the pressure on you to know all of the answers. Or perhaps you're in a situation at job or somewhere else where you have been relied on or trusted, your influence has been looked to uh, because people have looked to you for knowledge out of your experience. I know I've had a few jobs, a few roles where I have been expected, or at least that's the pressure I felt, was I was expected to have all of the right answers all of the right times. Sometimes, even as a pastor still, and when I'm in counseling sessions, I still struggle with that insecurity as the person's talking that perhaps I don't know enough, or perhaps I haven't figured out how to get through to this person yet and say the right thing. In fact, I think that the more I learn, the less I end up knowing, and then I'm driven by that kind of less feeling when I'm meeting with someone. I'm sure you've experienced that reality at some point as well. Over the past few years, I've been working at developing what I call my report card. And my report card is helping me understand that I don't need to know all of the right answers or have all the right solutions. It's helping me be okay with making mistakes because we learn from our mistakes, but also because I think there are greater things that we can give people than right answers. Often in my work at the mission, when I walk out of it, as I'm getting to debrief with myself of how I felt that interaction went, I'm not grading myself on how many scriptures did I read? Did I give them the right answers? Were they able to walk out a new way? But rather, I've come to believe this about myself, and that is my report card. Is it true that they felt seen, heard, understood, valued, and loved? So that's my report card. Are they seen? Are they heard? Did I make an effort to understand them, to stand in their paradigm? Did they leave feeling value? And did they sense not only God's love for them, but my love as well. And so that's kind of what has become my report card in my interactions with people. The, the success then, or its effectiveness for me in meeting with people, isn't about a performance or what I know. It's rather if someone has felt those traits, that he felt heard, seen, understood, valued, and loved. In fact, if we looked at every life story, every story of Jesus' life and ministry, the way that he interacted with people, if we studied the way that the social context happened in each one of the stories, I think time and time again what we would find is that in every interaction Jesus had with people, he didn't necessarily wrestle with right theology. Not that theology is bad. I'm working on my second master's in theology. I love theology. But right theology doesn't always lead to transformation. Jesus didn't always explain the why behind everything. In fact, usually when people started to press him for a why, he kind of had a way of dipping out and not answering questions. Additionally, I think when we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, we see that he stood and cared for those 
people, the women in the well, right? She felt seen, she felt heard, she felt understood, valued and loved. The woman caught in adultery, the man who's been waiting poolside his whole life for healing, in an encounter with Jesus feels seen, heard, understood, loved, valued. In fact, even in the stories where Jesus did not accept somebody, and meaning that he allowed them to walk away, he never, ever disvalued them. He always, even in those interactions, modeled what it means to see others, hear others, understand them, to value them, and to love them. Even in the young ruler, even with the guy that had to bury his father, Jesus never strong-armed, he never pressured. In each one of those, he gave them value by allowing them to make their own choices. This act of making sure people feel seen and heard understood, valued, and love is what we are going to be talking about this morning. And I think that the word in the Bible that describes that kind of reality the best for us is the word honor. And so the word I'm going to be using this morning, honor, and I think there is a a deep need for honor in today's world, in today's Church, And I think honor, honestly, is something that we, as followers of Jesus, those who follow someone who did really good at honoring people, should be defined by. It should be one of those things that our legacy has around it. Honor, though, I think is a word that we don't talk about a lot. At least we don't talk about it enough. In fact, I think sometimes when we talk about honor, we're really talking about respect. And as we're going to look at this morning, when the Bible mentions honor, and what I think it means out of honor is not the same as respect. We know we're supposed to honor our parents, our grandparents. We know what it means to honor a spouse or a friend. We know what it means to honor our bosses or those in authority over us. And we honor our family members that are no longer with us by telling stories of them as we look through photo albums. And as a country, we have federal holidays that are built around remembering and honoring certain people, such as war heroes or veterans. We have holidays that honor those who have shifted or transformed the period of time in which they lived in, such as Martin Luther King's Day, Washington's birthday, and so on. Though this sort of honor is more of a respect or a reverence than what I think Jesus models for us. And I think honor, a way of relating to each other, of being with each other, uh, is in some ways exactly what we need in a polarized society such as the one we are in. And it's also a practice that is disappearing from the divided culture and polarized society we live in. Honor begins with recognizing the divinely instilled value in another person, even when we disagree with them. Truthfully, from where I stand, and and many of the interactions I've had over the past few years with people, stories in which they've shared in my office, when they've left, they've often shared how they've been hurt by the church or by followers of Jesus. And so where I stand, I see that more and more this honor thing seems to be disappearing. On Wednesday, we had our prayer meeting as a church, and we were gathered together, and we were asked to share things that we were thankful for our church community. One of the things that I named is the way that I have seen you guys honor each other, that you have loved each other well, that you care for each other well. There's not drama. Where there is honor, there's an absence of drama, I'm convinced. And I'm exploring this topic of honor this morning, not because I think it's something we need to work on specifically as a church community, but I think it's something unique that we have, that I have not seen in every church community, something that we must mirror in the life of Jesus so that we can have a legacy of honor. It's something to own, to leverage for the sake of what I'll call missional good and legacy. Honor in the dictionary as a verb simply means to regard with great respect. And that is our approach to it in most of our society. And I think honor, though, is something more than what we show to others that we've loved or show over us. But really, it's this missional reality in nature. Or said another way, I believe that when we live lives that demonstrate honor, 
it carries the mission of God's kingship, his rule and his authority, his goodness and his good news to those, our neighbors, our friends, those who are in the places that we live, work, and play. Honor, when lived out in the places that we live, work, and play, leaves a legacy for a church. And I've come to think that the world around us would be completely different. They would have a completely different viewpoint of the church if we, as followers of Jesus, showed a deep devotion to honoring one another. In the portrait of the own church in America, which was a study, it found that most of us are will, most people around are willing to hear what people have said about Christianity, but a majority also sees the church as a place full of hypocrites. That means that those around us, right, those who are not here with us on a Sunday morning, aren't as turned off to God or to faith as we often assume, but they're turned off to our message because they think we have lacked sincerity, or we've been insincere in our message, or in other words, we have not modeled honor with them well. We haven't given them the opportunity to be seen and heard, to be valued, understood, and loved. We are a people that, that with a message of honor and love, but they don't see us as a people of honor and love. In fact, out of that survey, it said a full 72% of the people interviewed said they didn't think the church, that they thought the church is full of hypocrites. And other findings showed that 44% of Christians get on my nerves. Now, that one I can relate to. Sometimes Christians just get on your nerves, right? Anyone else? But at the same time, however, 71% of the respondents, okay, 71% of the people surveyed said they believe Jesus makes a positive difference in a person's life. And 78% that said they'd be willing to listen to that. And they'd be willing to listen and they want to hear what people believed about Christianity. This statistic means that in the places that you live, where you work, where you play, people might not be as turned off to the message of Jesus as we think. In fact, they believe that it has great significance, transforming power, sincerity. And people are actually willing to listen to it. There was a book a few years ago by James Emery White, and he said that out of the people he surveyed, and I think he surveyed 4,000 people, he said 86% of them would come to church if invited. That's what he found through his poll. People are willing to listen, yet as the first slide pointed out, They don't see us as trustworthy or with sincerity. They don't feel that we are seeing and hearing and understanding and valuing and loving at the same level that Jesus did. A quest for right theology or right belief cannot be as important to us as love and honor. Leaving a way of thinking, right thinking to the next generation is important But it is not everything, because the next generation is always quick to point out where our brokenness and our incompleteness, our vacancies, have shown up also in our theology. Think about it this way. The Reformation, perhaps one of the greatest acts of quest for right thinking, now 500 years later, is still being criticized by theologians and others, and and we are looking at how Era, that era's brokenness got read into the theology. Rather, what stands the test of time, what stands as legacy, is how we make people feel, how we've lovingly committed to seeing, hearing, understanding, valuing, and loving others. In fact, if I'd ask you to Tell me the stories about a time that you felt the most seen or honored or loved or understood. I'm sure you would tell me a story in which somebody was with you in a transformative part of your journey, a transitioning part of your journey, or when you were most down and out. I think in the moments of my life, the people that have mattered the most to me didn't give me right thinking or right way of living. They were simply there for me, and that was the transforming piece to put me on a journey towards truth. The Barna Group, when they were writing the book on Christian, they shared this. They said, in the research of our book on Christian, our team discovered that 84% of young non-Christians say that they know a Christian personally, yet only 15% 
of the lifestyles of those believers are notably different in a good way. So again, those in the places that we live, work, and play, they don't see us as sincere. They don't see us as loving and honoring. In fact, it seems to them that we just smell and look like everyone else. But Paul, when he's writing to the church in Rome, a church who is literally living in the slums along the rivers in the shadows of the seven mountains in the shadows of an oppressive empire, he tells them to not be conformed, right, to, to walk away from the behaviors and the customs of the world, to not copy them, but rather to let God transform us by changing the way that we think. And this is how Paul says we will learn God's will for our lives. And he confesses that transformed behavior and customs, uh, that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And when he tells them that, that he tells them that they should look and smell different than society around them. And he says it's good, it's pleasing, perfect. The word he uses for good in Romans 12, too, means distinguished. If you would look up the word good in the Koine Greek, the idea behind it is that you will have a confident distinguishment. When people experience honor, a sense of being seen, heard, understood, valued, and loved, I think that is a distinguishable part for us. In fact, the part we're going to look at this morning is actually right after Romans 12, 2. And we'll get there in a minute. But the idea is that Paul says, you guys should be distinguished. You guys should know God's good and pleasing and perfect will. And how that looks, how it looks morally and ethically in character, right, is this. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But I want us to realize that when people feel seen, when they feel honored, when they feel heard, understood, valued, and loved, they find a place to belong. When we experience this, when we experience what it means to be seen and heard, it's like we have a tribe or a community. Because all of a sudden, we feel that it's safe to feel vulnerable and transparent. And we know that that community then is safe and healing. We are living in a time where we are so divided, so polarized, so distrusting. But secretly, everyone is wanting a tribe, a community, a place to belong, a place where they can find it okay to be vulnerable and transparent. Carrie Newoff points out, the Barna study points, this study they, we've been looking at points out that despite a growing epidemic of loneliness, only 10% of them were willing to find that sense of community in a church. And he says, I wonder, sometimes I wonder if it's because people expect the church is the last place they'll find community. And that's tragic, he remarks. Of the many criticisms that can be levied at the church, lack of community shouldn't be one. Nobody should be able to out-community the local church. I love that statement. I think why no one should be able to out-community the local church is because our community, as we're going to see in Romans 12, should be built on these values of honor and love. So as we go through, as we look at this passage, it follows Romans 12 too. We're going to look at Romans 12, 9 through 13. And it will be on the screen overhead, but I invite you to follow along in your Bibles if you want as well. And as you are finding Romans 12, 9 through 13, let me just tell you about the time that Paul is writing this. Paul's writing to the church in Rome, probably around 68 AD. Nero has done more than climb to power. He's actually already begun his persecution. And, in, and that's not all. Nero has climbed the radar, got onto the radar of Rome through wicked ways, even having family members killed. And he's also found ways to throw out anyone who doesn't like him or disbelieves something he is saying. He has excommunicated, pushed out all of the theatrical actors right around this time. And he is expelling them and he has dictated a reform of their public circuses and festivals. And Paul's watching Rome beginning to deconstruct or to uh, experience trials from where he's at in Corinth. Now, he's writing to a people he didn't plant. 
He's writing to a people he probably had no say in their forming of community. In fact, this church in Rome, most people think probably came out of the Pentecost moment. So at the moment of Pentecost where Peter stands up and he says, guys, these people aren't drunk. They're just experiencing the gifts of the Spirit. They're just experiencing what it means to live a Spirit-filled life. Some of those people that were in town were most likely from Rome, and they went back and they led a bunch of other people to Jesus. Very few of them probably were Jewish in nature. And Paul's watching, and he's saying, things are crazy over there. I'm worried about them. I want them to find something that will leverage them and encourage them in unrest. And he starts his letter in Rome, Roman, the, to the Roman church in this way. To God's beloved in Rome. From the start of his letter, he's interested in reminding them of one thing. Their identity in the love of Christ. That moment, that statement, God's beloved in Rome, is important because Paul knows, writing to the people who live in the most divided and polarized society, that the first action is to remind them of their true identity in the love of Christ. Beloved is an identity. In fact, if you understand what it means to be loved, you then understand that you are called to love. Beloved means that you are secured. You are included, embraced. You are Part, you have taken identity from the sense of love in which you've experienced. And from that sense of love, you are now secure and you know what it means to feel secure and loved. And you are able to give that to others. That's your identity, he's saying. And from it, you securely know who you are, whose you are, and from the power you love. So let's look at Romans 12, 9 through 13. Paul then goes on. He says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So unlike most of Paul's other letters, he's not slapping anyone on the hand. He's not looking at a church that has been overtaken with problems. He's not trying to correct their theology. He's not trying to convince them of some behavior that they have lived or believed. Paul's actually writing to them simply commands, challenges, instructions on a simple way of living. For people who value what it means to live simply, we should pay attention to this because I think he gives them a secret to simple living that leaves simply a legacy. About this passage, theologian William Barclay says, here, in this short message, 9 through 13, Paul presents people with rules for an ordinary everyday life. In other words, they're just common sense ways of living, but they make all of the kingdom difference in the places that we live that we work and we play. And T. Wright likewise reflects the commands he gives in verses 9 and thir- through 13 are meant for all Christians. They offer a no-nonsense vision of Christian living. Verses 9 through 13, perhaps more than anything else in Pauline letters, captures a no-nonsense approach, vision of Christian living. And I love that idea that it's no nonsense. This is just a common sense way of living in the places that each one of us live, work, and play. Eugene Peterson, when he wrote the message, it's not a translation, but when he, when he began to kind of try to capture the intent or the heart of God behind a passage, he carried out this passage, his understanding in this way. And it's a beautiful creative form. Love from the center of who you are. As the love must be sincere, right? Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master. Cheerfully expect it. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. 
Now, at the core of this passage, Paul is helping them to understand what it means to develop sincerity as a church community, to love, as Eugene Peterson said, from the center of who they are. The thing that people want the most in today's time is sincerity. They want to feel love. And it's the very thing that Paul calls the church to experience, to do in the shadow of the empire. The legacy Paul wants for this church is for people to simply love each other and to love others, not out of obligation, not as a necessity, but because he and they genuinely should and do care for each other. He wants them to have a legacy that truly sees, hears understands, values, and loves those around them and in their spheres of influence. The stuff Paul wants from them isn't kind of like a lofty idea or ideal. To Paul, this is what the church is. This is what it should look like when living in a divided world of an empire. This sort of living should revolutionize the way that people see the church, and it would revolutionize the way that people see the church. William Barclay says there can be no hypocrisy, no play acting, no ulterior motive in Christian love. The Christian love is a love which is cleansed of self. It is a pure outgoing of the heart to others. Paul's not calling anyone to anything new. He's calling them to model the behavior that we've already established that was found in the life and the ministry of Jesus. We saw that that's the thing In the statistics we looked at, the people want out of life. They want a place to be vulnerable, to belong, a place in which they can find themselves and hear about a message they really do believe is transformative. But this thing that we are saying Jesus was most known by is also the thing that if we do wrong, might have the biggest effects on us. N.T. Wright points out that nothing undermines Christian work so instantly as a gloomy face or, in that matter, a false smile. The word hypocrisy that shows up in the New Testament carries with it the idea of an actor, one of those people that Nero would have pushed out, uh, who put on a fake face to act out. He's saying nothing makes the church less effective or carries or maims the the image of Christ, scars the image of Christ as much as when you and I actually have an experience that identity of being beloved or experience the spirit of God. When you and I are living out of obligation or necessity, we put on the mask. The missional legacy or the communal glue that Paul gives to the church in the shadow of a divided empire is this. Be devoted to love and honor. And the verses before and after kind of explain what that looks like, but I really think that they're just explaining what it means to be devoted to love and honor. And so the first thing we see is that we must be devoted or dedicated, right, to living with sincerity in the places that we live, work, and play. Love must be sincere, Paul writes. This is about allowing people the opportunity to be genuine and transparent with us. It's about allowing people to be seen, heard, understood, and valued, and loved. It's about letting them okay, be okay with not being okay. It's about treating others the way that we want to be treated and not giving them band-aid statements. Perhaps one of the things that we do the most as a church that I think works against us is what I call band-aid statements. And that is when you lose somebody and you say, oh, God needed them more than you did. Or when you're sick in a hospital and you say, God doesn't give us anything more than we can handle. These statements, statements that are meant for good, are really a misuse of scripture. They're band-aid statements. They don't heal the wound. They just, we try to cover it up because we push it down. Just focus on something else. We must be dedicated to loving with sincerity. Sincerity says, I love you, not here's the answer. We must be dedicated to clinging to the good in the places that we live, work, and play. In fact, Paul says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And what I like about this text is it starts with the hate part. Sure, it says, like, hate it. You know, don't push 
towards. And the word it uses for hate actually means to kind of divide yourself off from. But the way that you do that isn't by focusing on the bad, because the word cling is an action, and it's actually a word in the Greek that implies glue. Glue yourself. So how you hate evil isn't by setting up a whole bunch of teaching and standing up and saying what's wrong and having these rules that we stay away from, but it's actually by clinging yourself to good. It's by gluing yourself to good. John Wimber used to say that the more I think about my sin, the more I sin. The more I think about loving Jesus, the less I sin. Cling, glue yourself to good. But I think this also means that when we're walking with each other, when we're walking with those around us, we find the good in people and call it out. One of the most transformative ways that I think we do this is uh, written in a book called Hero Maker. And Dave Ferguson, he says, we need to practice conversations that are I, the letter I, letter C, C, N, letter N, U, I, C, N, U, that we can call out the good, the gifts, the stuff we see in each other as a way of encouraging. When somebody speaks to your value, and this is my own journey of, of back to the church, is that somebody looked in me, saw something in me, called it out in me, and all of a sudden I wanted to leave everything else that I had. I was willing to put away 15 years of trying to make it in the music industry because somebody put something in me. That thing is something that was already inside me. They just called out who God created me to be. The next thing we see in this passage is that we must be devoted to one another in a way that our love is contagious and kind of a foretaste to our church and to heaven in the places that we live, work, and play. He's giving this command to a church knowing very much that this divided empire is looking in, and he tells them to live devoted to each other in a way that others will see. In fact, if you would read the historic book, The Rise of Christianity, it is written by Rodney Stark. He's a historian from Harvard and Duke University, and he has written a book on how he believes the Roman Empire fell. And the rise of Christianity, he says, the church in Rome within the first few centuries after this letter became a place that valued women more than anything else. It valued people who were slaves in society more than anything else. And he says those things, they also valued the sick. The way they lived out those things, minus even the supernatural, the, the God encounters, the good teachings, he said those things are what brought down the Roman Empire. So here Paul's giving them a glue that in a few centuries will live out in a way that is so countercultural to the world around them. We must also, he says, be devoted to honoring others in the spaces that we live, work, and play. So we go from creating this intentional space for others or prioritizing them to then honoring them. To put our honor, he says, one another above yourselves. It carries the idea for me of building a platform for somebody else. It's the act that Dave Ferguson calls hero making, that when you're looking to, to encourage or disciple or influence somebody, you actually are working at building a stage for them to succeed on. There was a book called Halftime, and I'm trying to remember the guy's name right now, but he kind of got to his point after 50 years of working in the news and media, and he had a midlife crisis, and he said, I want to get to a point where my fruit grows on other people's trees. My fruit grows in other people's trees. There's people that have said what makes a society last is when the old men are willing to plant trees for shade they'll never sit under. That's what he's saying here. Honor one another above yourselves. Build a platform for somebody else. We also, we see, must be devoted to the Lord in the places that we live, work, and play. He says, never lack in zeal. Right, Never be on passionate, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And I think this is Paul's way of reorchestrating them back to realize that no matter where you work, no matter where you play, no matter where you live, do what you do for Jesus above all things else. Never lose the passion of what you're doing, the zeal of what you're doing is for Jesus. And when that bar is higher, when we're looking at it as an act of worship, we're focused on Jesus and not impressing others. And we're also then less likely to let others down in a way that the statistics have revealed. 
Next, we, we must be joyful in our trials and our tensions in the places we live, work, and play. Paul writes, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. I think this is one of the hardest things in Paul's message here. Right? Joy is an experience. It's, it's, it's a mindset. It's not an emotion. Joy is something that holds on to a vision that is greater. We know where this journey leads with Jesus in heaven. And those things must now fuel us in the places that we live, work, and play. Must keep us orchestrated. And that is the joy we must hold on to. That is the hardest part. And then we must also practice inviting others to the table in the places that we live, work, and play. Paul writes, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. When you practice hospitality, hospitality tastes like being devoted to love and honor. And it's because you're simply doing this. When you are living out hospitality as it was understood in this day, you are giving someone else the head of the household. Remember, Jesus teaches on this. When you sit down at a table, don't take the seat of honor. The seat of honor is a unique place. When you are a guest of hospitality, when you are allowing people to experience your hospitality rather you're making the other person a guest of honor you're inviting them to the head of the table and i think paul understands that when we are devoted to love and honor the most important thing of this passage i think this here is the climax of the voice it's a matter of giving the other person value and when they experience value they disarm they become transparent and vulnerable and it's then that the heart is softened and the spirit of god can plant seeds In my opinion, I think, as I said in the beginning, that we often have a respect issue. We confuse respect and honor. We we know we have to respect people we don't disagree that we disagree with, and you know I really don't like him, but I respect him. But with respect, we can differentiate that. Honor is so much more than that. Honor is a matter of putting oneself, someone else, above you. It isn't just liking their traits. It means that we make heroes out of those around us. That we see those in the church community as more important than our own selves. It means that we practice conversations of I see in you. In this way, then, our legacy as a church isn't inviting people to a right way of thinking, but to discovering their value in Jesus. The word in koine is a beautiful word. It implies the very thing that sets value for everything else. So here... He's saying, honor each other. See the price by which everything else is set in the other person. Stink bug. Paul took this idea seriously because he brought it up time and time again. In fact, if you think about it, in Philippians 2, he tells them the same thing. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't be about yourself. Rather in humility. Value others above yourself. Okay, that's Paul. That's Paul. Maybe that's just his thing. No, actually, Peter, someone who also spent time at Jesus, even spent more time at Jesus, when he writes to his followers of Jesus, actually, right before his his own death, he writes, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. So if you think this just is for the church, make sure you pay attention to that first thing. Love the brotherhood is about loving the church, but he says, honor, elevate, put up, make heroes out of all people. But fear God and honor the king. Those who spent time with Jesus the most knew the power of the spirit. They realized the love which they were called. And they called themselves and reminded each other to love and honor others. Because they knew there was great value when we see, hear, understand, and love others. This week as the worship team comes forward, I invite you to practice in the places that you live and work and play. By leaving a legacy of hearing, understanding, valuing, and loving those that you interacted with. Be devoted to love and honor. Convince other people that they are loved and and have value because they do. Thanks to Jesus. Thanks to the way he's created us, but also because of his work on the cross. with number 228 in the blue hymnal at the Lord's Prayer. Sing it together.